Welcome to Breaking Therapeutic Barriers in Relapse Refractory Multiple Myeloma, team-based solutions for integrating novel antibody platforms and improving myeloma care. I'm Dr. Sagar Lonial from the Winship Cancer Institute of Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm pleased to welcome my other panelists from Winship, my nurse practitioner colleague, Sharice Gleason, my pharmacy colleague, Dr. Catherine Maples, and my ophthalmology colleague, Dr. John Kim. I'd like to thank Medical Learning Institute and PeerView for providing this session and GlaxoSmithKline and Sanofi Genzyme for providing the educational grants to this webcast. We'll be asking you a series of polling questions throughout this activity. You may want to keep track of your responses. Also, we've prepared some practice aids that we will be highlighting during our discussion. You'll wanna to refer to them throughout, so please take a moment to download these tools before we get started. During this broadcast, we encourage you to ask questions via the live chat throughout this virtual event. Please click the live chat tab on your device to participate, and we will be available to answer questions live throughout the session. Let's get started. Here are my disclosures and the disclosures of my colleagues. and the, the planning committee and content peer reviewers uh, and their disclosures. And again, we will be talking about some agents that are unlabeled or are in investigational status only. Uh, we will make note of that if that's in fact the case. Uh, and, uh, and we will follow CME guidelines during the course of this uh, uh, virtual event as well. Please download the slides and practice aids and apply for CME, ABIM, mock. Uh, NCPD or CPE credit by clicking the buttons located in the left-hand panel. Uh, and again, uh, please feel free to tweet out some of what you hear or ask additional questions through the links that you see uh, listed here. So for today's agenda, we're going to talk first about an introduction to antibody therapy and myeloma, current guidelines, and why we need to do better in the context of relapsed and refractory myeloma. And then number two, tumor board discussions on managing patients in early relapse and those with more heavily pretreated disease and how effective sequential therapy with antibodies can lead to optimal clinical outcomes. So let's start off really talking about the story of antibody therapy in multiple myeloma. Before 2015, I used to joke about oncologic irony. The fact, the fact that a disease that makes too much monoclonal antibody didn't have a monoclonal antibody with which to treat it. And that changed in 2015 and 2016 with the approval of daratumumab and elotuzumab. And more recently, we've seen approvals for daratumumab uh, in the sub-Q formulation, daratumumab in, combination, uh, in combinations for newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. Uh, we've also seen approvals for isatuximab in the relapsed and refractory setting. And more recently, we've seen approvals for belantamab mafodotin in the triple class refractory patient population. And each of these certainly represent important steps forward for us. And part of what we are challenged with now in 2021 is thinking about how to integrate each of these new treatment approaches in a way that is logical, that is coherent, and allows us to take full advantage of each of these drugs so that patients can get the best short-term and long-term outcome overall. Now let's start off with anti-CD38 antibodies. And what you'll see is that both daratumumab and isatuximab bind to CD38. And CD38 is present on the surface of plasma cells, probably in higher density than it is on other cells. And both of these agents appear to induce on-tumor effects through CDC, ADCC, ADCP, and direct cell apoptosis. Interestingly enough, daratumumab also appears to uh, uh, have an effect on immunosuppressive regulatory T cells, as well as myeloid dendritic cells, whereas isatuximab also seems to have um, uh, activity on the CD38 ectoenzyme that is on the surface of plasma cells. And each of these lends their own unique flavor to what these two monoclonal antibodies can do in the context of management of patients with multiple myeloma. Now, when we talk about belantamab or Belamaf, uh, Belamaf is an immunoconjugate that targets BCMA, 
with multiple mechanisms of action as well. Unlike other antibody drug conjugates that lose their ability to fix complement or partner with, uh, um, uh, with other effector immune cells, Bell Bellamaf does have the ability to do ADCC and ADCP as well as um, uh, antibody drug conjugate associated direct cell killing and also induces immunogenic cell death. So each of these really, I think, represent unique and important ways to think about using Bellamaf, not just in the refractory myeloma setting where it's currently approved, but also as we begin to think about partnering it with other drugs and we begin to think about moving it earlier and earlier in the treatment paradigm overall. It is clear that antibodies do uh, have, a, have a major role now in the management of patients in relapsed and refractory multiple myeloma. And uh, certainly in previous discussions that I've had, I think it is important for us to think about patients in first relapse, trying to maximize the benefit of that response and that using an anti-CD38 as the backbone to which you either add a proteasome inhibitor or an IMID represents a major step forward in the management of early relapse multiple myeloma. And as you can see here, the preferred uh, category one are either DARA plus bortezomib, DARA plus carfilzomib, or DARA plus LEN. Again, given that most of our patients are progressing on lenalidomide maintenance, the likelihood of partnering with LENDEX is pretty low, uh, but certainly there is now significant data partnering with POMDEX if you wanna use an IMID, or with bortezomibdex or CARDEX. Uh, and some of those trials we'll talk about coming forward as well. Now, again, I think it really is important to stress the importance of this triplet-based combination, particularly focusing on uh, the use of an antibody as the main backbone of therapy. And this data um, is, uh, is a couple years old now, but I think really highlights an important factor. And that is the idea of saving good drugs for later may ultimately rob patients of the ability to get that drug. And the reason why I think that's important, as you can see in the top portion of the slide, is that in the non-transplant patient population, you can see the drop-off between each subsequent line of therapy. And what you'll see is that between first and second line therapy, you lose 56% of patients. Between second and third, you lose another 45%. Between third and fourth, you lose another 42%. So if your idea is to save drugs for later, that later may never come because patients may never get the opportunity to have access to that drug. So let's begin the next section of this, which is the interprofessional guidance on using antibody therapy in early relapse. And I will tell you uh, that I feel very fortunate to be part of a great team uh, that really bands together to, uh, to talk through uh, how to manage patients, and we really do it in a team fashion. Uh, and as, as some of my colleagues will probably note, I make sure that each new patient meets all of the team members uh, at the initial visit, knowing that it takes all of us to really be able to optimally deliver care for a given patient at a given time. So let's start off with this case, and then I'm going to have my, my panel colleagues here uh, chime in on some of these questions on the right side of, of, the, of the graph here. So this is a 60-year-old female with revised ISS stage one multiple myeloma. She had standard risk myeloma. ECOG performance status was good. Initially received RVD induction followed by transplant and then received R maintenance. She, uh, was she did progress after about three years of therapy uh, and had mild renal insufficiency at that time point. So I'm gonna pose it to my colleagues. Uh, how would you guys approach this? How would we approach this as a team? And tell me a little bit about uh, antibody-based therapy that you guys might consider that we would think about using, as well as extended exposure to LEN and how that informs treatment and counseling on sort of next steps and, and things to anticipate. Yeah, I think, Sagar, this is a common patient that we see in our practice, that standard risk patient who's progressing on LEN maintenance. And an antibody-based triplet is, you know, for us, that next treatment, it makes sense for this patient. Um, one of the things that we're always looking at is, you know, comparing that, is this a biochemical progression versus symptomatic? And clearly this patient has symptoms um, now with some mild renal insufficiency. So it's something that we want to take into consideration as well. 
it's, this is a, you know, fairly young patient. Um, and, you know, that extended exposure to LEN would have us go a different direction in either an IMID or a proteasome inhibitor with that uh, antibody. And uh, Catherine, uh, talk, talk to me a little bit about how renal insufficiency might impact choices of therapy in addition to um, uh, the, what, what the patient's resistant to based on prior therapy. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say I agree with Sharice. This um, is a very common patient we see. Um, fortunately, with the uh, mild renal insufficiency, an antibody-based triplet would still be very appropriate for this patient. Uh, we do have data um, from the um, Icaria trial that I know you're going to be discussing that it is safe to be given in our renal insufficiency patient. So I think using an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody at this time would be our next go-to. Um, and I know we're going to talk a little bit about the differences between daratumumab and isotuximab, and, and there are some differences there to choose from, but I think we would use that as our backbone here. Um, and with the renal insufficiency, using something like pomalidomide would still be appropriate for this patient. Um, we could consider carfilzomib as well. Um, so just kind of taking the patient as a whole and thinking about what, what si side effects and dosing strategies might work well for them. Um, but I think that it would be an appropriate next step to use a CD38 monoclonal antibody. Okay. So if we talk about... Um giving them uh, um, an anti-CD38 based salvage regimen, uh, whether it's ESA or DARA, what would be some of the, the, the counseling steps that you would both uh, make with a patient? Uh, because uh, as we know, I'm, I'm usually in and out of the room pretty quickly um, and you guys are there uh, to sort of come in and make sure that the patient has the information and support that they need. So how, how, what, what are the things you guys might talk to them about? I think that, you know, a lot of times that conversation starts with the provider. Um, we've, you know, been watching this and whether it's the physician or the advanced practice provider, we would open that door to that next line of therapy. So explaining the reasons why, going over their disease status, why we're making that change, and then briefly discuss the regimen that we're recommending and side effects. You know, the beauty of this team approach that we have is then we can then hand it off to our clinical pharmacists to go in and give it a more in-depth conversation at that point. But I think we feel those early questions, um, the maybe the caregiver or family member that's present as well and give them that opportunity. Um, if this is a patient that we regularly see, we've been having these conversations. So I'd like to think that we've prepared them because a lot of times we know it's coming because we've seen those small changes. And so we've already had some of these discussions, but at this point, it would be much more in depth. Yeah, I agree. And I, I really like uh, being able to come in after those discussions have been had and be able to um, just go into kind of the details of the regimen. Um, I think it's helpful to provide calendars and really map out what it's going to look like for the patient. So not just talking about the side effects of the drugs, but what days are they going to have to come to the infusion center? How often does that change? Um, and then also talking about with them any supportive care medication medications that may need to change because of the new regimen. So, you know, oftentimes they're already on their VTE prophylaxis and their VZV prophylaxis, but just kind of making sure that they're still taking those, reiterate why they still need to take those. Um, so I think I try to approach it by discussing the treatment regimen and then also the supportive care as well. Yeah, I agree. And when we're thinking about counseling on these, this new option and, you know, patients ask all the time about the timing and when it's time to make that change. And so that's really important when we're looking at this, trying to differentiate, is this a biochemical relapse versus a symptomatic relapse? So we're looking at the timing of it. Are, is that protein doubling and tripling, or has it been a slow increase we go back to our CRAB criteria. Do they have any of those features again? And in the case of our patient, we have that renal insufficiency, but we're again looking for that hypercalcemia or those other risk factors. And this is a time that we would actually restage this patient. So we would have had another bone marrow biopsy, had a complete imaging, whether it's a PET CT or whole body CT or MRI, 
and look at that disease again. We're also looking at those risk features. So this was a standard risk patient, but now we're looking to see have they acquired something different like a 17P deletion that would make them high risk. We also want to look at the performance status of our patient who's in front of us. What other comorbidities do they have? And what are those effects from, in this patient's case, that RVD that they got up front and that ongoing lenalidomide? And then it's a discussion with our patient. This is a 60-year-old patient. The good chance this patient's still working. They're going to have thoughts in that shared decision, decision making on that next line of therapy as well. So we're looking at frailty in the patient as well and convenience. Um, patients, you know, want to come different days of the week to get their treatment. So they might see us in clinic, but go to one of our other infusion centers to get their uh, treatment on another day that's more convenient for them. So all of these things take place in these conversations. So, uh, you know, when we talk about the use of antibody triplets as a next step, um, uh, I think it's pretty clear that in this patient, uh, the guidelines and the evidence clearly do support the use in category one evidence. And as you can see here, if you want to use DARA plus carfilzomib or DARA plus pomalidomide, you have that data with the CANDER trial and the Apollo trial. If you want to use esatuximab plus POMDEX or ESA plus CARDEX, you have that data from the ICARIA and the IKEMA trial where clearly the PFS was um, significantly better with the addition of DARA to either of the backbone approaches and the same with esatuximab. Uh, esatuximab significantly improved the PFS, MRD negativity and overall response rates uh, by partnering with either POM or carfilzomib in large phase three randomized trials. And some of the data that really speaks to that is this data from the CANDER trial, which is carfilzomib plus DARA-DEX uh, this was uh, published in uh, Lancet very recently <clears throat> and demonstrates a pretty significant prolongation in progression-free survival uh, for the CAR-DARA-DEX versus CAR-DEX. Uh, and I do think it's important to recognize that in some of these patients uh, that, the, um, uh, uh, that the median PFS for the KD arm uh, was actually not that far off from what we would expect uh, in the Endeavor trial. So uh, it's not that one arm didn't perform as well as one might expect. It's that, uh, that the, the addition of DARA to carfilzomib really was a pretty significant improvement in progression-free survival. And this is the Apollo data that looked at sub-Q DARA plus POMDEX, which also sub sub substantially improved PFS versus POMDEX. And I think it's important that when you try and compare carfilzomib-based combinations with pomalidomide-based combinations using an anti-CD38 antibody, what you'll see from the phase three trials is that it looks like the, uh, the POM-based combinations are shorter. But remember, that's an artifact of the lines of therapy. Most of these trials were enrolled in Europe, where carfilzomib may be first or second relapse therapy, uh, whereas pomalidomide is second or third relapse therapy. So what you're really seeing is not that one drug or one combination is clearly more effective than the other, but instead what I think you're seeing is an artifact of lines of therapy that may impact the ultimate efficacy uh, of that regimen uh, when compared with POM uh, uh, in the relapsed and refractory myeloma setting. So Catherine, you want to talk to us a little bit in terms of what are the next steps, uh, presuming that DARA is what we're going to move forward with. Yeah, absolutely. So thinking about daratumumab and starting a dara-based regimen, whether that's with carfilzomib or with pomalidomide, uh, we talked a little bit about the patient education and counseling. So um, with the daratumumab, one of the bi biggest things is going to be the route of administration now with our subcutaneous formulation being uh, what we prefer over the IV formulation and the NCCN guidelines do recommend that it can be um, interchangeably used. So with the Apollo being sub-Q and, and CANDER was studied with IV, we could use sub-Q with both. Um, so educating the patient on what that subcutaneous administration is going to look like and the risk for infusion-related reactions. Um, we will review all of their medications that they're currently on for any drug interactions that may require any dose adjustments. Um, as Cherise mentioned, assessing the patient as a whole for any of their comorbidities, any um, disease cytogenetic changes, or any lingering toxicities from their prior regimen that may make an impact. 
um, supportive care, like we talked about, and then any insurance appeals that may need to be done can be approached by the team. So typically, um, if it's an oral based chemotherapy regimen, I will assist with the appeal there. And if it's the infusional based um, appeal or peer to peer that needs to be needed, the nurse practitioner or PA will be handling that in the peer to peer. Um, so kind of using the team approach to make sure that the patient is cleared from the insurance perspective and is ready to go. Um, taking a little bit of a closer look at the sub Q versus IV formulation. Um, the biggest difference is, is, of course, is the administration. Uh, but another thing to point out here is that the dosing is different with subcutaneous being a flat-based dosing and IV was traditionally a weight-based dosing. The administration with sub-Q is just a three to five minute push, whereas IV, we saw the lengthy infusions ranging anywhere from an hour and a half to about eight hours. Um, so we do need to observe our patients with sub-Q DARA. Um, after cycle one, day one, at our institution, we do monitor them for three and a half hours, which was the median time to an infusion reaction in the phase three Columba trial. Um, and then with IV, you can always consider using that split dose if you need to for a time perspective. Um, but Sharice, what are some other considerations that you may have when choosing between sub-Q DARA and IV DARA? I mean, we've pretty much uh, changed the majority of our patients over to subcutaneous. It's just so well tolerated, and you also see the uh, reaction rate go down significantly. Um, it's a convenience for the patient to get in and out of the infusion center quickly, um, and most of our clinical trials have allowed us to move over as well to subcutaneous. We have a handful of patients who just prefer the IV. They don't want to rock the boat. Um, but for the most part, um, it's much more convenient for the patient, and we've gone ahead and changed over. So can, can, uh, can either of you speak to the period of observation? You mentioned the period of observation after cycle one, day one. What does that look like when you're in cycle two or you're at the end of cycle one or cycle 15? Uh, because what, I, what I'm certainly hearing from a lot of outside providers is uh, that the package insert suggests they still have that three hour observation indefinitely. I don't think that's really been our practice. Correct. Yeah. The, um, we only are observing after cycle one, day one, um, the, the package insert doesn't, um, unless it's been recently changed, but to my knowledge, it doesn't specify an exact amount of time. So I think that that will be institution specific. Um, we, we chose, what we chose based off of the median time from that Columba trial. But um, I, I think that that may vary a little, but what we have found is that, you know, the, the risk for those reactions is significantly reduced after cycle one, day one. Um, so we are not observing past that period. Additionally, for our patients that are on IV daratumumab that we are switching over to sub-Q, we are not monitoring those patients at all either. So um, it's truly only a fresh start that we've been monitoring. Okay. Um, so let's talk about a couple of other safety and practical considerations when using anti-CD38 antibodies. Um, again, we talked a little bit about the hypersensitivity reactions. Uh, myelosuppression does not appear to be significant alone. But when combined with the image, it does appear that the neutropenia certainly uh, is a little bit more um, uh, significant than one might expect if you were to give either uh, LEN or DARA or ESA by themselves. So certainly you do see a little bit of an overlap in terms of uh, neutropenia grade three and grade four. Mm -hmm. Fatigue, I think, is something that patients uh, uh, often experience as a consequence of their disease. Sometimes the dexamethasone crash can give you that sense of fatigue as well. One change for us that was almost in a way mimicking uh, what our lymphoma colleagues have done with rituximab, however, was the HPV uh, reactivation issues and screening for hepatitis B core antibody and surface antigens prior to initiation. And I will tell you, I don't think we're perfect in that process of having it all done before their first dose. Uh, but I think, um, uh, Catherine, our approach has been to make sure it's drawn at the time of that first dose and knowing that we can always come back in with antivirals later on if we need to. Mm 
Yeah, I would agree. Um, it's not a contraindication, you know, to, to, to not start treatment if those aren't resulted yet. So we will very commonly have those labs drawn on cycle one, day one, but they haven't resulted yet back before the patient gets started. Um, but if the results come back positive and we need to start prophylaxis with something like entecavir or tenofovir, we will do that after the fact. Um, so I would agree it, it's often done on their first day of treatment. Yeah, I think um, just to go a little bit more into detail with some of the hypersensitivity reactions, we, we mentioned this briefly before, but there is a difference with the DARA formulations as well as with isotuximab. So I'm um, kind of pooling all of the different data from all the trials together. We see around a 48% reaction rate with the first dose of IV daratumumab. It's significantly lower, as Sharice mentioned, with sub-Q daratumumab at around 11%. And then with first dose of isotuximab, it's around the you know 40% range. So we do require pre-medications for all three of these monoclonal antibodies. Um, notably across all three, you'll see your antipyretic with acetaminophen, um, diphenhydramine, as well as a corticosteroid. We typically are using dexamethasone methadone because that's part of their treatment regimen um, already, but you can also use methylpred as well. Um, with isotuximab, the package insert does recommend an H2 antagonist as well. And then um, just clinically, the daratumumab products do have post-infusion recommendations uh, that we used to use. We have really kind of cut those out of our practice, and we are not using those unless patients really experience that steroid crash. Um, we may give them a low dose a couple of days after, but for the most part, in terms of preventing infusion reactions, we've stopped using those post-medications and really only use these required pre-medications. Okay. Um, well, uh, so let's get back to our patient. Um, what if Michelle had received esetuximab? How would the change? How would the team's interventions have changed in terms of management? Um, and so, um, I don't think it would have changed the answer uh, to question one or two. Uh, it might have changed the answer to question three. So let's talk a little bit about what we might have said differently for ESA versus either sub Q or IV Dara. Well, I think one of the biggest differences is that it will be an IV infusion, so it won't be a subcutaneous injection. And then uh, the biggest difference to me, I think, is the ongoing every other week dosing. Um, so daratumumab does eventually go to a once monthly dosing schedule, whereas esetuximab remains on the every other week dosing frequency. So having that conversation with the patient, as Therese mentioned, this patient might very well still be working. Um, do they have the ability to come to the infusion center twice a month, or would that be very burdensome? Um, doing monoclonal antibody infusions on the weekends can be challenging at some institutions because they may have less staff. Um, the, the long infusions and risk for reactions may prevent some of that. So a lot of times this does have to be done on a weekday, which could be limiting. Um, so really the, the counseling points I, I think are very similar the biggest difference to me would be the, the administration, but Sharice, um, you may have some other thoughts as well. No, I mean, that that is pretty much it. It's, it's that timing of the infusion and that it stays at that day um, one and um, day one and eight, I'm sorry, day one and 15 mm -hmm. on that um, long-term and it's so working out the infusion, working it out with their schedule. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think those are subtle but but important differences for people who are thinking about using esetuximab um, uh, going forward. I mean, I think this is the data that really established the benefit of esetuximab with POMDEX. This is the ICARIA trial. And again, in a two or three prior lines of therapy group of patients, you can see a significant improvement in PFS, almost doubling of PFS. The data does look quite similar to the Apollo trial. Uh, again, with uh, uh, both of which used POM in the POM label indication, which might, might explain why some of the progression-free survival uh, is a little bit shorter than what I think many of us are used to seeing. If you then go to the IKEMA trial, which looked at ESA plus CARDEX, uh, again, what you see is a substantially improved progression-free survival. And as I mentioned before on the CANDOR trial, the KD arm actually performed almost identical to what it did in the Endeavor trial, 18 versus 19 months for the control arm. 
really demonstrating the potency of ESA plus Cardex in that phase three setting here. And as I mentioned before, if you begin to look at uh, patients who received, um, uh, who were uh, in CR, stringent CR, and MRD negativity, almost double, if not higher, rates were associated with the use of ESA Cardex compared to Cardex alone overall. And I think really uh, relevant to the case presentation that we made here um, is that the benefit for ESA Cardex was seen in patients uh, whether or not they had renal insufficiency. But I think what we're beginning to learn, and in fact, our center has a trial now looking at anti-CD38 antibodies in the context of newly diagnosed myeloma who present with renal failure, that anti-CD38 antibodies are really very good at rapidly reversing renal insufficiency. I think we've always thought about the PIs and dexamethasone as playing in that role. Uh, I would now add the anti-CD38s to this as well. Uh, and as you can see, the benefit was really quite striking whether patients had normal or abnormal renal dysfunction for the addition of, uh, um, uh, for the addition of isatuximab uh, in the context of the IKEMA trial. So we now really think about bortezomib, dexamethasone, and anti-CD38 as the three drugs we begin to use very rapidly when patients present with renal dysfunction of any reason in the newly diagnosed or the relapsed myeloma setting. Yeah, I think we've uh, touched on several of these, but just thinking about some specifics with, with isotuximab. So the dosing is going to be that weight-based dosing similar to the IV daratumumab. So 10 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, the administration is weekly for the first four weeks of cycle one, and then it goes to that every other week until disease progression. The average infusion time is around three and a half hours with this product. Um, one thing to point out that I think is important to note is that to date, we do not have any data in patients who previously received daratumumab. So there is some question of if they've already received one anti-CD38, can we use another one? I mean, we currently do not have any data to support that. Um, but there are sub-Q formulations that are being investigated for this product. So I think that that will be um, something to look out for in the future. And um, Sharice, if you have other comments for this drug. Um, you know, I think um, we've pretty much covered it. We know that um, AEs reported in the clinical trials, the infusion reactions for isatuximab was about 38%. Um, our nurses are well-versed on handling that in the infusion center. So that first dose um, can take longer. Um, we see some reactions with upper respiratory tract infections as well as diarrhea, so that's not unusual. We have to keep in mind, again, um, sending that type and screen prior to initiation of an anti-CD38. Um, inform the blood bank if a patient is receiving isatuximab. Um, these infusion reactions are very well managed. Um, we have a lot of experience with that with the pre-medications, as you talked about, Catherine. And we're going to monitor for neutropenia in these combination regimens. It's really more that other component that's probably causing more of the issue if you have it with an IMID where it could be myelosuppressive. So we're monitoring those blood counts, um, checking the chemistry on the patient, but monitoring for signs of neutropenia infection in these patients. Yeah. And go, go ahead, Catherine. Oh, well, I was just I was just going to say, I think one point on the neutropenia component that we have been uh, discussing lately a lot more as a group is the use of GCSF for these patients, um, both for a daratumumab or an isotuximab based regimen. Um, but if they are experiencing neutropenia and we want to keep with that dose intensity of the IMID or the PI, um, being able to use once weekly, twice weekly growth factor to help maintain that dose intensity is something that that I think we've been utilizing more in our practice. We have, and even if you need to throw it in in the second and third week, when you really start to see more of that drop, just so you can get their counts back up by the time they're starting day one of that next cycle. Yeah, I think, I think the infection prophylaxis is something we begin, we've begun to see a lot more frequently with the anti-CD38 antibodies. There are a lot more patients that get URIs or get treated with antibiotics. Um, and so the, the threshold for giving those, I think, has always been low in myeloma. I think it's even lower now with the anti-CD38 antibodies. But more importantly, the use of IVIG, I think, is something that we're using a fair amount more as well. And we don't routinely give it for a number. 
I think it's important that um, we, we, because it's not uncommon for myeloma patients to have a low IgG level, but sometimes that IgG can be quite functional and they don't have significant issues. Um, and even if we do use IVIG therapy in patients that have had frequent infections, we do try and give uh, a six month run and then a break. Uh, because I think the idea of continuous IVIG is just, it's, it's tough for, for patients to, to stay on over time. Okay, so let's switch gears now a little bit and talk to a team-based approach to antibody options in a much more challenging patient population where we do have fewer choices in patients with heavily pretreated multiple myeloma. So we know that, uh, uh, that, uh, um, that we do have new options in the context of refractory myeloma. So let's talk through this case. Uh, this is a 76-year-old gentleman with RIS as stage two myeloma initially. Uh, did have uh, underlying coronary disease and somewhat limited mobility. Uh, initial treatment consisted of VRD induction, transplant, R maintenance, and achieved a CR. Relapsed several years later, um, and then um, received POMDEX, uh, or sorry, had, had progression and then received DARA POMDEX, achieved a VGPR, and then about a year later developed a new L2 plasmacytoma with a rising M protein, was switched to carfilzomib cyclophosphamide and dexamethasone, uh, worked initially but had progression after about seven months of therapy. So I think this, at least in my mind, is a patient population that we're gonna be thinking a little bit about a BCMA-directed therapy. How would the group think about CAR versus ADC and sort of um, counseling the patient on pros and cons of each of those approaches? Yeah, for this patient, Sagar, you know, he's a little bit older. He has some underlying other comorbidities. And, you know, we would certainly talk about both options, um, but the CAR T could be just a little more aggressive for this patient. It might struggle with it a little bit more. Coming up with something um, looking that he could still receive in the clinic. Um, you know, he's progressing pretty rapidly, really, through you know, regimens, and it makes sense to switch to a different type of treatment at this point to something um, like BCMA therapy. So, you know, thinking more um, about an ADC makes sense in my mind for this patient. Yeah, I agree, Sharice. And I think a couple of other things that we could um, consider for this patient or patients in general when deciding between the two, I think your point about his rapid disease progression is a really big one because um, we know that antibody drug conjugates are kind of off the shelf. We can typically get these patients started on their new treatment in about a week. Um, Pending, all, pending everything comes together, um, whereas CAR-T is going to take several weeks to get the product made. So we may not have time or we, we may need to use bridging therapy for, for that patient. Um, and then also something to consider, I, I don't know where this patient lives um, and his caregiver support situation, but with the CAR T cells, they do have to live close to the center um, and they cannot drive for eight weeks after. Um, and of course, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit of the driving and eye issues coming up with, yeah. with LMF. So that's a consideration there too. But I think those are some things that for a patient perspective and, and what their life might look like um, that we would talk about with the patient. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a great discussion in terms of Pros and cons, if you're going to choose a BCMA-directed therapy on trying to help a patient think through uh, what the optimal response is, it's very interesting. I find that patients have sort of already done some of that work before they come in, and they've got a preconceived notion about what they want. And then when you actually start going through the data, they realize that it's not such a simple discussion overall, I think, as, as, as we struggle with as well. So let's talk a little bit about the DREAM2 data, which led to the FDA approval of belantamab, mafodot, and erbelumab in a heavily pretreated relapsed refractory myeloma patient population. So this was a randomized phase two with about 90 plus patients in both arm, one receiving the 2.5 mg per kg dose and the other receiving the 3.4 mg per kg dose, which was the recommended phase two dose. And what we noted in that trial was that the 3.4 mg per kg dose was not significantly more effective and did have more grade three, grade four ocular toxicity, which we're gonna talk about uh, going on forward. But it's important to recognize these were patients with a median of six to seven prior lines of therapy, 
very heavily pretreated. Many of them had pre-existing cytopenias, renal dysfunction, and other complications as comorbidities of their treatment before they even came on to the trial. And I think what really struck me when I first saw this data uh, um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the interim review was not just the overall response rate, but really was the duration of response. And the reason why I really hit on this in the context of refractory myeloma is that patients often have a lot of comorbidities that they bring to the table with refractory myeloma. So DOR, or duration of response to me, is a composite endpoint bringing together safety and efficacy. And so you have drugs that have 30% response rates in refractory myeloma, but the DOR is very short because patients can't tolerate that treatment. They don't stay on it for very long. And so I think that to me is a real benefit of Bellamaf is that the DOR is one of the longer DORs we see of any drug in refractory myeloma, whether it's DARA, carfilzomib, pomalidomide, selinexor, melflufen, or even bortezomib back in the original, you know, 20 years ago when it was approved as well. So I think that that to me is really important. And what you'll see on the right is that the response rate doesn't really change based on prior lines of therapy. And I think that's a lot to do with BCMA being such a new target for the management of patients. Now, as we know, in every, in every drug, once it works in refractory myeloma, we try and bring it a little bit earlier. And this is the DREAM-6 study, which combined Bellamaf with bortezomib and dexamethasone. And what I think you'll see here again is that the overall response rate jumped to 78%. Many of these patients were refractory to bortezomib, and yet they did respond when you added bortezomib into uh, to Bellamaf. And that, again, really speaks to some of the synergy that we saw when you bring these drugs together overall. And more recently, Suzanne Trudell and her group from uh, Canada have pre presented data on the Algonquin study. And the Algonquin study is a combination of Bellamaf with pomalidomide and dexamethasone. And if you, again, it's a relatively small study. It was a phase one, phase two run-in. But if you look at these patients, in aggregate, the response rate was in the 80s. When you look at imid PI refractory, it was in the 90s. And when you look at IMID, PI, and DARA refractory, with only 11 patients, the overall response rate was 100%. And what I think this really speaks to is the combinability of Bellamaf with other standard agents and the fact that the IMID antibody combination really is very potent and powerful, which I think is of significant importance when we're thinking about uh, combining uh, these drugs together. So, Sharif, let's talk a little bit about sort of um, how, how we play tag team on some of these patients when we talk to them about uh, Bellamaf as a potential treatment option. Yeah, it, you know, so it's whichever one of us is seeing that patient, you know, we open that conversation and it's, you know, this conversation is a little different because it's a different side effect profile than we've had before. Um, and, um, you know, just you know, a patient who's relapsed refractory, you know, they're always wanting to know what's that next thing. So, you know, we're going to advise the patient, um, we're going to go over those side effects with the patient, we're going to bring our clinical pharmacist into it again, but we're going to talk about those, the possibility of those vision changes for the first time. And, you know, a lot of these patients are older, they might already have some other vision deficits. So those are things that are brought into the conversation. And when you're talking to a patient that you might need a driver to bring you to clinic, um, the dry eyes, that blurry vision, it's very worrisome to them. Now, the upside of it is when we're starting Volantamab, there's no dexamethasone with it. And these patients have had a lot of dexamethasone along the way. So that's something that's positive for them. So for my role, we're gonna, I'm going to talk to them about those side effects, things like advising not to wear their contact lenses. And this will be a collaboration as well where, with our eye specialist. And Dr. Kim, I know, is going to talk more about this. Um, using the eye drops that are available, that they want to keep those eyes, um, eye drops in um, at least four times a day. Something that we found on the clinical trials that dexamethasone eye drops did not help. Um, so I think that's something for the community uh, teams to be aware of as well. Um, not everybody, you know, will get to see an eye specialist who used this drug and collaborated with us on that. So I think it's important to ensure that these ocular symptoms aren't permanent, 
what we've seen on the clinical trials, some of these patients get dosed like every six weeks and they still respond to therapy. Um, so holding the drug, dose reducing the eye symptoms um, will improve um, it's, so it's not um, permanent. So I think those are really important things to talk to um, the patient about um, when we're bringing on a new drug that has a different type of side effect. Yeah, and I think you know the other thing that I would add in is um, when you look at the schedule for a patient who's receiving Belomath, it's really one dose every three weeks. Um, mm -hmm. You know, many of the other drugs we look at in this refractory myeloma patient population, we've got them coming in multiple times a week for count checks or supportive care or hydration mm -hmm. or other things along those lines. This really is outside of the ocular issues, which we're going to talk about in a moment is yeah. a relatively easy drug to give for patients and for them to take as well. It really is. And, you know, once patients start, uh, they really like that. It's, you know, it's different than everything that we've just, you know, put them through. So it is a much easier regimen to tolerate and that every three weeks is nice for a patient. All right. So one of the, one of the things that came up at ODAC, uh, which was really interesting, was how are hemonc docs going to partner with eye care professionals and ophthalmologists uh, to really give this drug in a reasonable way? And I thought it was really interesting that one of the, uh, the medical oncology consultants on ODAC looked at the rest of the panel and said, we do this all the time with other drugs. Why do you think the hematologists can't figure it out? Um, so, uh, John, do you want, you want to mention a little bit about sort of how, how we partner together in this sort of approach on uh, prevention and, uh, and monitoring uh, for patients getting Belomath? Well, first, I'd like to thank you uh, for inviting me to participate in this uh, panel. I think I've learned a lot about multiple myeloma that I have in years uh, since my days in medical school. Um, I think as ophthalmologists, we always seem to be on the uh, outskirts or the edges of uh, uh, medicine internal medicine or uh, the other specialties. And so we're always happy to kind of be able to partner with um, our medical, other medical specialists uh, to assist them in, in the care of their, their patients. And it really leads to a, a team-based approach uh, to, to these uh, patients uh, that hopefully are very helpful to, uh, uh, to your service. Um, I think it's interesting that we've come across this medication that has uh, the ocular side effects is, is really their primary adverse event. Um, and so I think it's, very, it's it's uh, great that you guys have been very aware of uh, of these uh, events and then be able to uh, incorporate us in the, in the care team. I think it's uh, just to go on, I would say that it's very important to have a really good baseline um, examination you know, for these patients. These are older patients. I can have a lot of the uh, ocular comorbidities uh, from cataracts to glaucoma to macular degeneration. Um, and then certainly dry eyes is, is very common in these older patients. And so you really want to get a baseline of what uh, their vision is, what their ocular surface exam is, um, and really kind of be able to establish what that baseline is so we can follow any changes uh, that may be related to these medications. Yeah. And, you know, I, I do think one of the really key parts is, and, and I, I feel very fortunate to have partnered with you and others in the group here, uh, that... Um, recognition that sometimes there's a sense of urgency for these folks that um, I know you guys are usually booked out six, seven months uh, in terms of your schedules, uh, but sort of getting that early partnership to say, we may not have a lot of lead time to get people started. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to need that flexibility to be able to get folks in and then get them on your schedule going forward, given that they're going to need exams going forward with relative uh, frequency. Um, and so I think establishing that trust and that, that, uh, that discussion early on, I think is really important for this to, to work for patients ultimately, right? Oh, correct. And I think, uh, I mean, I think our schedules are always busy. I'm sure your schedule is always busy yeah. as well. Um, but we can usually kind of fit that one more patient in. Um, they tend to come in and that's probably a long part of their day uh, to be in our office, uh, to go through all the steps and the, and the testing that we do. Um, but, you know, fortunately since we're here on you know, campus together and, and a lot of other practices may not have this uh, benefit, but since we're on the campus together, um, we'll usually the patients that when they come in for the day of their, their treatment, um, and then we can uh, get an assessment of, uh, how they've done since their last treatment, and then kind of be able to forward that on to you on whether, you know, the next step in treatment's okay, or, you know, based on the, the criteria, do we need to, uh, 
uh, make some changes and we can communicate that to you uh, right away. Yeah, no, I think that that's, that's really important. So Catherine, you want to talk to us a little bit about the, the nuts and bolts of getting a patient on to Bellamap. Yeah, absolutely. So this medication does have a REMS program due to the ocular toxicity side effects. I could probably talk about the REMS program for an entire hour on itself, so I'll try to be brief here. But um, the REMS program involves the oncologist has to enroll, and then the oncologist can assign delegates. So um, Dr. Loneal is enrolled in the program, and then he has assigned his nurse practitioners like Sharice as well as myself as the clinical pharmacist as his authorized delegates to be able to submit some of the paperwork as well. Um, the patients will enroll. We typically do this when we educate them on their new treatment regimen. So it's kind of all part of that process of educating them on the side effects, the eye drops, the no contacts, and then we'll get them to sign the paperwork to enroll. And then uniquely also the infusion center has to be enrolled in the REMS program. So I think that's one very important step that needs to be mentioned, especially um, for some of the institutions that may have multiple infusion sites, uh, making sure that they're all enrolled properly. Um, and our pharmacists in the infusion center at Emory are the ones that will complete that final checklist portion of the REMS program. Um, so once we get all the REMS set up, um, patients will see the ophthalmologist or the optometrist at baseline, and then they will see them every three weeks thereafter um, to evaluate their eyes for any toxicity and if we can safely proceed. Um, the Volantamab does have the antibody component, so there is that risk for infusion reactions. We have standardly pre-medicated all of our patients with acetaminophen and diphenhydramine. Um, the, the recommendation in the package insert is not that that has to be given initially up front, but what we found in our experience is that patients were having reactions. So we have put that in as our standard of care. Um, and then the counseling portion we, we've talked about already and coordinating with our eye care professional partners is very critical as well. Um, so some of just the dosing considerations, we will start out at the 2.5 milligram per kilogram dosing, which was the FDA approved dosing for this treatment. It's a 30 minute infusion, which is really great um, for our patients who may be more accustomed to some of those more lengthy infusions. Um, so the, the REMS program, we talked about getting everybody enrolled. And then prior to each exam, we will submit the what's called patient status form to clear them for infusion. Um, and patients will be instructed to start their eye drops at that time as well. Um, so I will uh, bring this back to Dr. Kim, um, but part of, part of my role is that I can help kind of facilitate some of the forms that need to be completed for these patients. So in our practice, as Dr. Kim mentioned, it's super great that they're on campus with us. It makes it so much easier that the patient can come first thing in the morning um, or their first part of their day. They can come see the eye care professional and then get their labs done, come see us, and then go to the infusion center. So in a perfect world, that's try how we try to do it, where everything can be done on the same day. Um, but the eye exam is good for 14 days. Um, so you do have that period of time if, they, if your patient does want to see a eye care professional in the community and then bring that paperwork to you. We, we've done that for several of our patients that live farther away. Um, but typically what I do when we have a patient that we're starting on Bellamaf is um, our nurses will get them set up with their appointment. So um, we heavily rely on our team to get everything scheduled. So um, the nurse will get everything scheduled for the patient. And then once that eye care professional is identified, I will send them the forms in our electronic medical, medical records. So if I saw that Dr. Kim was seeing our patient, I would say, you know, hey, Dr. Kim, you're seeing this patient tomorrow for their baseline exam. Here's the form that we will need filled out. Um, and then I will pass it off to Dr. Kim for what kind of happens after that. <laughs> I think it's great. I think it's certainly uh, good to get that little heads up that uh, we're, we're expecting a patient uh, um, you know, for these uh, for treatment uh, treatment evaluations. Um, I think I said before, you know, it's very important to get a good baseline examination. So that includes uh, a slim lamp examination, 
uh, good evaluation of the ocular surface, a refraction that uh, um, tested their, if their vision could be improved with the change in their glasses, and then uh, and certainly a dilated examination you know, as a baseline to uh, see if there's any other underlying retinal uh, issues. Um, you know, from there, uh, they have this after that baseline and certainly they get their first treatment. Um, you know, the next treatment dose is say, you know, at least one week after the uh, initial dose um, and then or two weeks before the second dose. Um, the way our setup goes is the, you know, this, the next evaluation is really a lot of times that day of uh, the planned uh, next treatment. And that actually probably works better than doing it too soon after the first treatment. Because if there are some initial you know, side effects and you know, make sure the patient's aware that you know, the vision can be a little bit blurrier er early on uh, after that first treatment, uh, but some of it may resolve you know, as you get closer to the planned second dose. And so if we see them really too soon, we're going to say, oh, they may have more of a grade two, grade three type evaluation. And do they need to you know, hold the next treatment? Whereas if you see them closer to the next planned dose, if, you know, they, their symptoms actually may improve. And then we can, can you know, proceed or let you guys know that it's okay to proceed with the, the next treatment. Yeah, I think that's a really important point um, because I, th I, you know, I think sometimes that is lost on the ability not just to develop, but actually resolve. And so that timing, I think, is important. And, and sure, I think we definitely like to you know, emphasize you know, the, what they need to do you know, uh, during this uh, treatment regimen. And that's really the use. Uh, preservative-free artificial tears, and so it's a little different than the regular big bottles that you can kind of find on the shelves. Um, these are typically going to come with these individual vials, and I think it's very important since these patients are going to be using these drops very frequently during the day um, to emphasize that they should be the preservative-free um, medications. So we say at least four times daily, but they can use them up to eight times, you know, or even every hour um, if it really seems to be helping, you know, their symptoms and helping with their vision. Um, but definitely that it's uh, preservative-free. Um, uh, uh, type of medications uh, for the, the teardrops. I'm sorry uh, for that. Um, you know, then as they get closer to the next uh, treatment dose, and again, you know, for us, the day of uh, the next planned dose, um, then we can really evaluate them um, after they've been using their uh, eye drops um, and hopefully uh, assess them and, and if their symptoms are uh, resolved or the findings are, are good, then they can proceed with the next treatment. Yeah, and I think that one thing we have done for a couple of our patients, um, to your point of making sure they get the right eye drops, is that there is an eye drop um, supportive care program through GSK for patients that have difficulty obtaining the correct eye drops. So that's something that we can also enroll them in, and I've enrolled a couple of our patients in um, to where they'll get eye drops mailed to them. So we, we have utilized that before. And then the other most common toxicities that we see with these patients is typically thrombosis cytokinia and anemia, um, especially in patients if they're starting out kind of with a low reserve to begin with. So we may need to bring them in for platelet transfusions or blood transfusions based off of their um, blood counts as well. So John, you want to talk us through a little bit about what you look at when you're, lo when you're seeing what's going on. And in specific, this patient did re re achieve an early response uh, but got grade two keratopathy on exam after the fourth infusion. The infusion was subsequently held and did drop his best corrected visual acuity by about two lines. So you want to talk to us a little bit about what that looks like? And Sure. You know, a couple of things that we'll see uh, on the, in the cornea, the, you know, the, the main ocular surface of the eye, or the window of the eye, are the punctate Type staining change that you'll see uh, with uh, fluorescein, and so uh, the in the photograph here is a um, uh, some of examination of the cornea um, using a cobalt blue light, and that really highlights the staining uh, that you see uh, from the fluorescein. Um, it may be tough to see in the exact picture, but it's really these little dot-like um, green uh, uh, dots that you see that, that indicate the that kind of devitalized epithelium and that may relate to the toxicity related to uh, Bellomath. Um, the other things that you'll kind of see is known as these um, uh, MECs or these microcyst-like changes in the cornea epithelium. And those a lot of times you'll see initially out in the periphery and they'll kind of work their way in towards uh, the center, you know, with time. And those combine between the uh, kind of the punctate, the punctate changes and the uh, microcyst that would you know, contribute to changes in their vision, so the blurriness they may feel, 
uh, grittiness or foreign body sensation they have, and really sometimes a change in their vision uh, that we can see with uh, patients on Belomac. Yeah, and, um, and so in this patient, uh, they did develop a grade two um, um, uh, keratopathy. And so based on that, the dose was ultimately held. Um, do you wanna mention a little bit, um, cause I'm gonna show the scale here as well for grade three and grade four about the, uh, the pattern with which the MECs begin and then how they regress when you hold the dose. Sure, yeah, we think it, the, the, I think the pathophilia physiology of these microcysts is, is still kind of unknown, um, but it's probably uh, changes that can incorporate the limbal stem cells. So those are located out in the periphery of the cornea, kind of where the uh, cornea meets the sclera. And those are the cells that go on to produce uh, the uh, corneal epithelium. And so as they kind of move their way through their um, uh, division and their process, uh, process and development, they're going to start out in the peripheral cornea. Um, and so as those cells kind of, again, go through their development, you see the changes move uh, progressively centrally um, as, the, uh, as the normal changes in the epithelium occur. Um, and it's really when they become more in the central visual axis is when you start uh, seeing some more of the visual symptoms uh, with that. Um, you know, so the grade two type changes, uh, you may see them more in the periphery. Um, the grade three becomes more central. Um, I guess I will say that the grading is, is typically based on, you know, the, the worst eye, you know. So if you have one eye that's only lost, uh, you know, one line of vision or have mild corneal changes, um, but the other eye, um, you know, for again, to the asymmetric effect um, that has more grade two changes, you know, then we kind of report that um, uh, to you guys and say, well, you know, do you have to you know, withhold treatment or do you modify treatment? And that, you know, is a little more gray area that kind of let uh, you guys kind of make a decision on, you know, if they've had a you know, really great benefit from this treatment, you know, is it okay still to proceed? And a lot of times the eye findings, even though they kind of still consider maybe grade two, are on the more mild uh, side of grade two. And so, again, it's something that we kind of communicate with you guys to say whether it's okay to, you know, still treat uh, when it's still, quote, you know, grade two type uh, changes. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's really important. And um, uh, for a couple of reasons, uh, obviously, to, to know how to best approach the patient, but even more so, you mentioned the MECs typically start at the periphery and work centrally. When they, when you hold a dose, they start to regress more centrally quicker than they do peripherally. And that's why there's a disconnect between time to visual acuity correction, which is relatively short, the average is 21 days, versus time to keratopathy regression, which is closer to 40 or 50 days, because again, that visual issue is much more central, uh, which I think accounts for some of that. And if we look at DREAM2 in terms of overall frequency of adverse events, what I think you'll see is 72% of patients develop keratopathy of any form, uh, and, um, uh, but only uh, uh, about 56% actually had symptoms with that, and only 18% had best corrected vision changes of 20, 50, or worse. So only 18% actually hit that uh, 20, 50 threshold that requires significant dose uh, modification, uh, and uh, only three out of the 95 patients actually had to stop because of uh, keratopathy as well. So I think that these numbers put it a little bit more in perspective, and the reversibility piece that we see so frequent I think is important as well, because pretty much every patient that develops significant keratopathy does have regression over time, um, and so no patient has developed permanent long, long-lasting uh, visual, visual changes as well. So I think as we sort of wrap up uh, the Bellamaf uh, management approach, uh, you know, from my perspective, we're excited to have a potential treatment option for patients with heavily pretreated relapsed refractory myeloma. It does require that partnership in a multidisciplinary care team with, uh, with our eye care professionals and ophthalmologists to really help us gauge the impact that Bellamaf is having uh, on, on, uh, on vision, and then make sure we take that into account when we make decisions on treatments. And then uh, our whole care team really does come around this patient uh, to, to make these decisions. As Catherine had mentioned previously, we don't typically use significant premedications unless patients develop adverse events. And um, I think we're very fortunate to have a system that really facilitates this kind of high level uh, partnership uh, amongst all of our specialists here. I don't know if anybody else wants to 
add any further comments as well. Yeah, I would I would agree that it's really to emphasize you know with the patient that you know they get they it certainly commented about these eye findings you know the eye symptoms, um, but in pretty much every case that we've been involved with uh, here, uh, they all have resolved that there's just been no permanent loss of uh, uh, best corrected visual acuity and really even no uh, permanent uh, kind of symptoms and related to kind of the dry eye you know, type findings that we see. I think that's really important too and we uh, discuss with our patients and just also reinforce that while you do have that 14 days for that exam like you said Dr. Kim getting it closer to their actual next dose gives us a better idea of what it, if we've, we've had improvement then we can actually treat the patient. Well, thank you all. I really want to thank my colleagues for just a tremendous discussion on a number of different challenging uh, patient-related topics that I think brought home the importance of this team-based approach in the management of patients with relapsed and refractory multiple myeloma. Please remember to complete and submit your post-test and evaluation for CME, ABIM, MOC, NCPD, CPE credit. Uh, and if you missed anything on this great presentation, uh, you can go to the URL listed here, download the slides and practice aids by clicking the buttons, watch a replay of the, of the event, and again, join the, the conversation on Twitter at Peerview. Uh, and thank you so much for your attention and have a great evening.